Welcome everyone, Quistine here to talk about some of the worst legendary lords in Total War Warhammer 3 Immortal Empires Part 2. For the dwarves, it is Ungrim Iron Fist. The dwarves are certainly one of the worst races in the game right now, and Ungrim is one of the worst legendary lords in the game as a result of that, simply because of his race. But he's actually not really that good to begin with. Faction-wide effects, all he gets is 10% speed as well as some recruitment and construction cost benefits for Slayer buildings and Slayers. Now, the problem with that is he doesn't get the faction-wide benefit in terms of Slayer upkeep. If he did, that is, might be a completely different discussion. Imagine a 50% Slayer upkeep benefit for Ungrim faction-wide. Now, that would be fairly interesting, I have to say. Furthermore, when we look at Ungrim, he does get free items. These are pretty neat, but the thing about Ungram is that his special skill line really isn't that special. Yes, he does get the improved uh, death blow, which is always nice. He does get an, a replenishment benefit for Slayers, which is actually pretty good, but they will take a significant amount of damage. The problem is he's buffing Slayers in the wrong way. He's giving them melee attack. He gets 5 from his special skill line, 5 from his uh, Lord effects, as well as the passive ability Journey's End, which doesn't work. Now, he also gets minus 25% upkeep for Slayer units, which you can reduce to minus 50%, fair enough, through a banner, but I feel like that 25% upkeep benefit should be 50%, and it should be a faction-wide benefit, not tied to a banner. In fact, completely remove the banner, because it might interfere, I think, I'm not entirely certain, with your ability of gaining Archivists. Ungram is actually the worst duelist of all of the Dwarf Legendary Lords. Yeah, no joke. In a one-on-one -on -one fight, he would actually lose against all of them, with the exception of Forek, in a campaign with the entire uh, melee skill line unlocked. But against others, against uh, Belagar, against Forgrim, against Grumbrindle, he would actually lose a duel. Because that's supposed to be his winning uh, saving grace. Well, he's actually not that gr good from a dueling perspective either. Until you drop him to a very low HP and he does start using death blow, then he kind of evens the odds, but still is pretty awful what he has to work with. Furthermore, although he starts with a tier 2 settlement, he starts with Slayer Shrine of Karakadrin. Now, there's nothing wrong with that inherently, except you're probably going to have to get rid of that in order to get, say, artillery and quarrelers. The dwarf playstyle is heavily focused on Quarrelers is the best playstyle in the moment. You can use some Slayers, but they're going to take a lot of damage in battles. Beyond that, the starting province he has and Peak Pass just isn't really that great because there's only two settlements. Of all the races in the game, the Dwarves actually kind of need provinces with a lot of regions, or at least three regions in them, because otherwise their really poor growth is going to hurt them even further. See, the problem is... This tier 2 settlement is only generating summon growth. And even when mods to remove the public order penalty, like the one I have installed here, he's still uh, it's still going to be an issue. Control really isn't too much of a problem in terms of a rebellion, unless you're playing like Skaven, for instance. But um, it can be an issue in terms of affecting your growth. And that's one of the problems with dwarves. It gets amplified in these kind of provinces because you don't have enough settlements to get enough structures to improve the growth in a substantial way. And certainly the dwarves do suffer in a significant fashion because of it, because of their situation. Also, his grudges are all over the place, like a grudge to fight through Astrogoth and take Karak uh, uh, Vlag. Yeah, enjoy dealing with that. Another grudge specifically aimed at Vlad. Not at the Vampire Towns, but at Vlad himself to win certain battles. It is all really silly and very badly designed as a yes. campaign. Ungram, I would say what Ungram needs is faction-wide benefits to Slayers in terms of either upkeep or survivability, physical resistance, ward save, you name it. He could really use that. And Journey's End actually working and being a faction-wide ability. That would be great. And... Also, complete rework for the dwarves. Until that happens, he's going to be one of the worst legendary lords in the game. For the Empire, it is Emperor Karl Franz. And isn't that a sad state of affairs? The guy who features in so much of the marketing, the guy who could rightly be considered the main character of Warhammer Fantasy, in a lot of ways, is also one of the worst legendary lords in 
the game. What makes Carl Franz so bad isn't that he has bad lore defects or a bad skin line. They're decent, but they're not exactly astounding either. Rather, it's the fact that, one, he has a bad starting position. Reichland is a great province. The problem is it's also very vulnerable. Like, uh, Eilhart and Grunberg are vulnerable as element. And it's not exactly like Helmgarth is going to offer you uh, a great uh, level of protection against Orion and Grom, both of which, and even Kemmler, all three of which actually, might decide to attack it. That is one problem. So his starting position is a vulnerable one. He actually has to take all of these settlements to begin with, and that just means every single campaign you play as Carl Franz, you're going to waste multiple turns, five, six turns, in order to deal with his starting enemies, which isn't a great situation to have to deal with. But that's where the issues begin for Carl. That's not where they end. Uh, he does get... Lord of Kuran, campaign movement range, diplomatic relations. So you'd think he'd be a great legendary lord, but the problem is Imperial Authority is awful. It's awful because the Empire is awful as a race. Their unit roster in Tier 1, Tier 2, until basically Tier 3, but really Tier 4, is just really not a good unit roster. They have a good economy, but it's not the best economy. Well, you could say they have a decent economy. They have decent growth, good public order, etc., but having to manage the entire empire when we're talking about the various electric counts being minor factions that anyone sneezes at them and they collapse, yes, that is a fairly major issue. The empire isn't really the empire in the game. What do I mean by that? Well, the empire in the lore is supposed to be the most powerful faction in the setting. That isn't a joke. Yes, they are beset on all sides, but they're powerful enough that they can manage that. Playing the Empire is not like that. Imperial Authority just really creates a lot of issues in your campaign. And while you might accept dealing with all the downsides that come from crumbling Imperial Authority, it's actually best right now, if you're playing an Imperial campaign as either Karl Freds or Balthazar Gelt, to basically abuse Imperial Authority by declaring war on Nuln, then selling this territory back, uh, selling this territory... Uh, specifically this particular settlement, Winsenberg, selling it to Gelt, uh, then forcing, then getting the Imperial Authority event to force it back again and again and again to get an infinite amount of Imperial Authority. It's much better than what you're supposed to do, which is protect the entire empire. Like the cast dwarf show you how you ha can have a political situation where you care about the entire, the welfare of the entire race, the Empire is just really a bad system. It's so bad that the system we had before Imperial Authority is actually a better one uh, than what we currently have, what we've had since the Hunter and the Beast DLC uh, that was introduced in Warhammer 2. I mean, granted, there are obviously benefits with the Electric Counts, all the items, all the regiments, all, all the state troopers, all the items. That's all well and good, but the problem is uh, the problem is when, that while this all of this gives the Empire a good amount of late game potential, the game right now in Warhammer 3 is all about the early game. And even late game, the Empire is still not quite on the level of the Greenskins, Vampire Cavs, Warriors of Chaos, Chaos Dwarves, and other races. They're just a decent race. So you have to put in a lot of effort in an Imperial campaign to even reach a level that other races start with in their campaigns. The only exception is, of course, the Hunts Marshal, because he gets a lot of those later game units, tier 3 units, tier 4 units, very, very quickly in his campaign. And don't get me wrong, he has plenty of issues. Now, of course, many of these things could also apply to Gelt, but here's the difference between Gelt and Karl Franz. Gelt can colonize mountains, Karl Franz cannot. Gelt has an easier time at using Nuln than Karl Franz. There's also that particular factor to take into consideration. And so Gelt ends up having a better campaign. Also, Karl Franz, when controlled by the AI, starts with this entire province and Helmgarth as well. So, Car uh, so AI Karl Franz is actually better than AI Balthazar Gelt. So an even bigger reason to play Balthazar Gelt than it is to play Karl Franz. It is something that needs to be changed. The Empire needs to be reworked. The Empire needs to be improved. They haven't really gotten significant improvements unless we count the Hunter and the Beast, which wasn't so much of an improvement. What the Empire needs, I would say, is they need to get um, they need to be able to get great swords and Huntsmen easier, they need to get uh, great cannons and Hellstorm rocket batteries easier in their campaign, like, as opposed to, like, Mortars should be a Tier 2 unit, great cannons should be Tier 3, 
Hellstorms could be maintained at tier 4, fair enough, but you need great cannons for sieges. Those are the kind of things that should be changed. And on top of that, you should have a reason to care about these minor factions, because as it stands right now, the only reason you care about these minor factions isn't because keeping them alive, give, alive gives you any benefit. Far from it. In fact, keeping them alive and confederating them is a genuine waste of freaking time. Because what you're going to get from confederation with many of these imperial factions, what you're really uh, going to get is a huge headache. Specifically, even if you confederate them, you're just going to get a bunch of territory that isn't going to be very well developed, that's going to be underdeveloped, you're not really going to gain significant benefits from it. So even confederating these factions doesn't feel worthwhile. And certainly some of the territory is worth it, like Midland is a great province, Ostermark is a great province, Talabaim can be a good province, but defending the entire empire is tricky. I'm not saying there isn't late game potential, there is. But there's also a lot of strings attached to it, and it's genuinely one of the worst campaigns in the game right now. For Grand Cafe, it is Miao Ying. Now, to be fair, it is a bit silly to include Miao, uh, Cafe in this kind of list, because both Ledger and Lords are pretty decent, but out of the two of them, I would certainly say Miao Ying is the worst choice. Looking at what you're getting is you're getting 10% leadership when fighting Demons of Chaos and 20% ammunition, as well as corruption benefit. That's okay, especially the ammunition benefit, but her brother gets an armor benefit for uh, for a lot of units, which helps him in a lot of ways. It helps him on Tottenham's resolve, it helps him on the defense, it helps him generally in battle. So his benefits are actually overall better. I'm not saying 20% ammunition is something to sneeze at, but uh, I would say that her Xiao Ming's benefit is just a better choice. Lord Effect-wise, she gets Supreme Matriarch, so she's really all about making a full ranged army work, which is all well and good, don't get me wrong. She does get Harmonious, which improves her diplomatic relations with Cafe. All good, though to be honest, you don't really need that much of a diplomatic benefit with Cafe and Factions, because it's going to be pretty easy to confederate them all the same. Uh, and it's not really going to help you to confederate Xiao Ming. Because confederations work best when a faction doesn't necessarily have a lot of territory. Xiao Ming will always get quite a bit of territory in his campaign, whereas Miao Ying may not necessarily do so. She's actually easier to confederate um, if you're playing Xiao Ming than it is to confederate Xiao Ming playing as Miao Ying. Uh, she does have a good lord effect like reload time reduction, eye of the storm, etc. She's certainly worth confederating, don't get me wrong on that subject, but worth playing as your starting legendary lord, not necessarily so much. The armor benefit is incredible because Jade Warriors are a tier 1 unit. Um, on, and on top of that, uh, beyond that particular point, you also got to consider this. Xiao Ming starts with a tier 2 settlement that has a training camp. So he'll actually get access to Jade Warrior Crossbowmen earlier than she will. He starts with the ability of getting Jade Warriors from a minor settlement. And generally with these kind of barracks chains, it is better to put them in a minor settlement than it is in a major settlement like Nangao. Now granted, you do have the advantage of starting with Nangao at tier 2, but you're actually going to want to remove this barracks and put it in, uh, you get it in another settlement, probably some, something like Wang Chang, something along those lines. So he actually, uh, right now, can get Hanyu Port, turn one, fairly easily, no problem whatsoever. He also starts with, uh, with more units than you do. Now granted, you do have the advantage of having a Sky Junk, and you do have the Celestial Dragon Crossbowman, neither of which are bad units, certainly they're pretty good units. But I would say that uh, Xiao Ming is just in a better starting position, has better campaign potential, better faction effects, and just will be a better campaign to play. It was the exact opposite in Realms of Chaos, but things have changed in Immortal Empires. The reason they've changed is because in Realms of Chaos, one of the gates of the Grey Bastion would start destroyed, and Miao Ying, controlled by the Eye, would just not handle it. But right now, the Grey Bastion is going to be very difficult to breach uh, for any faction that's trying to take it over, so that is actually a huge advantage for Xiao Ming, because he doesn't have to worry about Village or Zaytan busting through the gates, at least not quickly. They will eventually do it, but you have the time to deal with all that. Getting to the Greenskins, we have Skarsnik. Now, the Greenskins, as an overall race, are really good, and all of their legendary lords have some level of strength one way or another be it the insane endgame crisis that is Grimgore, Grom's major faction-wide benefits, 
AZAG's uh, climate ability, which is actually pretty substantial, and so on. But Skarsnik, he's pretty pathetic. The two benefits that he does have that are worth it are the upkeep and recruitment class for goblins, as well as the 100% character experience benefit for all heroes. Now, the upkeep benefit isn't as big of a deal as you might assume. Because as well, certainly it is nice and you'll be able to mass a lot of goblin armies, eventually you'll realize that goblin armies won't be able to do the job and you'll want to switch over to other units. Which Skarsnik cannot do so, so easily because he can only recruit orcs from Karakate Peaks. It's not like he has a situation where he needs to take Karakate Peaks and then he gets the ability of recruiting orcs faction Why? No, he can only recruit orcs from this landmark over here. Uh, if he builds it. And it takes a lot of turns to build it, which means you're actually going to fall behind in terms of getting higher uh, higher tier armies compared to your competitors. But okay, if it was just faction-wide effects, it wouldn't necessarily be too much of an issue. And if it was just faction-wide effects, I would probably put him over Warzak. It isn't just that. His Lord situation is pretty pathetic. He gets Lightning Strike Battles when reinforcements are present, Charge Bonus for Night Goblins, Squig Hopper units, and Skarsnik Swa. Now, the thing about that is, like, those uh, uh, Squig ho Hoppers are not really worth using in a lot of ways. Like, why would you use them as opposed to Trolls and Nasty Skulkers and Night Goblins in general? And his special skill line, well, the first problem that he has in his... A special skill line as he doesn't have the goblin tide skill line which would really help his nasty skulkers no joke a lord a generic goblin great shaman will actually have a better early game goblin army or just a better goblin army uh, than skarsnik does because of this skill this is a fairly substantial benefit unfortunately it doesn't affect night goblins but it doesn't matter because while your archers won't have that armor benefit, your night goblin archers won't have that benefit, your regular goblins will, and your nasty skulkers will. So not having that particular skill is actually a major downside in Skarsnik's campaign. And then you look at his special skill line. Yes, he does get a bunch of benefits to units in range and debuffs, his, uh, debuffs the enemies. But, a lot, but some of the stuff that he's getting here is just not really that beneficial. Here's the problem. Skarsnik is all about the ambushing benefits, right? Because he gets the ambusher skill, he gets uh, backstab, uh, uh, backstairs uh, tactics, etc. But he doesn't have, like say a leaf and R, he doesn't have a stock uh, stance, like an ambush attack stance. If he had that, this would be a very different situation and it would actually make him far more useful to use. He can only get ambushes if an army moves within an ambush, which is always finicky to get done. That's the thing, that's the problem in Skarsnik cam uh, Skarsnik's campaign. I mean, he's uh, he as a lord is so useless that even when you confederate him, he's not actually worth using to lead an army. No joke, it's actually better to get a generic goblin great shaman or a, gener a generic war boss uh, in, to lead an army as opposed to Skarsnik. What Skarsnik really is, he's a buffed up, uh, he's a buffed up Night Goblin war boss. Now that isn't necessarily bad in a lot of ways, but it's just the Night Goblin war boss is the worst lore choice for the Greenskins. So that's why Skarsnik is so pathetic. No, like, yeah, he might have a higher level when you do confederate him as another faction, but he's just not worth using. Now you might wonder, well, why not Warzak? To put Warzak on this list, why not put Azak? Well, here's the thing about Warzak. He's the exact opposite of Skarsnik. While Warzak has his own issues in terms of his lackluster faction effects, he really is good leading an entire Savage Orc army and making it really strong. He's also a very powerful caster as well. Azak uh, may not be so good, but he does have the climate benefits. He's really powerful in battles, far more powerful than Skarsnik is in battles. And because of Azak's starting position, he has the ability of putting a lot of pressure on Ungram or eliminating Ungram, which will actually help uh, AI Skarsnik, who will be able to hold a line or outright beat Forgrim. And then as Azak, you just come down here 
and you eliminate, uh, you fight Skarsnik's army, you defeat Skarsnik's army, and then you get his entire empire. Like, Skarsnik is useful more when controlled by the AI because he can gain a lot of territory that you can then take as Azak. And Azak has a lot more potential diplomatically, territorial wise, uh, than Skarsnik has. Like, before the patch, I would have, uh, before the Castorf patch, I would have said Azak is actually better than Grimgore. That's not a joke, just because you could let Grimgore do his thing and capture a lot of territory. That dynamic has changed. Right now, Grimgore is the best legendary lord, but still. As for Grom, look, Grom has issues in his campaign because of the territorial type, but Grom is absolutely ridiculous as a legendary lord. Yes, the territorial type does limit his potential in a campaign, absolutely, which is a shame, uh, but he'll gain so much money and have so much power, it's quite a, a level of absurd that you don't necessarily believe in until you actually play that campaign. Skarsnik, he, he'll he have a lot of goblins. That's it. That's all there is to say. Kostin, signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more. If you do enjoy my content, consider donating via PayPal or Patreon. I'd greatly appreciate it. See you next time.